Welcome back to the T-Max 500 service series on 49cc Scoot. My name's Brent and today I'm going to be trying to do some minor port work, basically clean up on my T-Max cylinder head before it goes back on the engine. Let's see what I'm trying to accomplish here. So right now we're looking into the inlet ports and this is obviously on the valve side where it enters the combustion chamber. And this area in here is what's called the bowl. So here you've got the valve seat and then this is the actual head material itself down here, the aluminum that the head is made of. And where the seat meets the head in a lot of areas you can see that you have to cut in there, they cut in so that the valve seats sit and when they machined in a lot of times they don't leave a smooth edge like right all around here where you can see the difference in the cast and where it's been cut you can easily feel that that is a very sharp transition from the head into this cut area and that's not a good thing for flow we want everything to be as smooth as possible and by as smooth as possible I don't mean a polished finish inside the port especially an intake port but we just want it to be smooth so if you run something like this scribe in here or you use your fingers you don't feel a big lip on anything you just want a smooth transition all the way through the port so my number one goal throughout this will be to smooth out all the areas where the valve seat inserts meet up to the actual cylinder head and make sure that I don't have any big ledges there or any sharp transitions you can also see some casting flaws some imperfections down in there that's not really my primary goal of this, but if I can get those rough spots out, I will. When you're here in person, you can put a scriber in there, you can put your finger in the port and feel around. It's pretty easy to tell where you've got these big ledges. I'm not so sure that it comes across as well on camera. So here's another way to look at this. I'm shining a light from above. This is basically the direction that exhaust flow would go into this port. And if you look right in this area, you can see how there's now a shadow behind this ledge. So you can tell it's a fairly serious ledge by the fact that I'm really casting a shadow on the other side of it. The majority of my time is going to be spent right in these areas that I just showed you, smoothing out those transitions. That's not to say that there isn't a lot of work that can be done all throughout the port if you really want to get into it. However, I am not a professional porter and I don't wish to take a great risk that I ruin the porting totally. Because if you get in there and just start removing material, then you can actually drop port velocity. So everybody thinks about flow. You want to flow as much as you can, so you need some huge port. But that's not really correct. You actually need a certain size of port, because if you just have a gigantic port, you lose all the port velocity. And that's really bad for low-end performance and throttle response. can be terrible for fuel economy and efficiency in general. So and if you get really really over the top then you can ruin horsepower totally but sometimes the big ports will work well uh, just at high end so at high rpm but i really don't want to change a lot of characteristics other than just trying to smooth out these transitions and get an increase in flow that way and most people say that the biggest gains that you're going to get easily are in those areas the other thing that I want to do is smooth out the transitions here on the intake side. You can see right here from the factory, I guess something didn't match up quite right as cast. So they just cut a little relief sort of in there to match up the intake to the port here in the head. But they didn't go ahead and blend that in. You can see it's really short, maybe a little more than an eighth of an inch. So I want to blend that down into the port. Again, just smoothing out the flow a little bit. I don't want to make any large alterations i just want to smooth everything out and that's present in both of these intake ports it wouldn't be a bad idea to do some port matching while you're at it in my case i've got it really easy yamaha actually matched these up pretty well what i did was i just bolted these on and then i can look down through here with a flashlight and it's easy to see because this is such a straight shot and really the only mismatch that i have is because of some casting flaws here on the edge of the intake Here's a close-up of the area that I'm talking about on the intake where it meets up with the head. And you can see right here, this will catch the tip of my scriber. It's just a little bit of overhang, a little bit of roughness there. 
Once I take that off, I've got a pretty nice transition from the intake into the cylinder head. If you don't have a straight shot where you can see and feel where the intake and the cylinder head are meeting up, then you can still do a gasket match even if you use one of these O-ring setups. You just have to create your own gasket. So in that case, what I would do is take the larger of the two, so just measure the inside diameter of both and see which one is the biggest of the two, and then I would create a gasket based on that. So let's just say that we're going to use my cylinder head to create a gasket. You can use gasket material or you can just use something like thin cardboard from a cereal box. Lay that across this area and then you can take a ball peen hammer and you tap around the edges. I like to tap around the edges first and then mark out the bolt holes. So once I get it roughly cut, in this case you're not actually going to use the gasket so the outside shape doesn't have to be perfect just so it fits well enough. Once you get that cut out, make sure you're very precise with where, where your bolt holes are located because otherwise any slop in there is going to ruin the whole process for you. So get those cut out, use a punch on those, and then you can bolt that down, bolt your makeshift gasket in place, and then tap around this edge where your port is, the inside diameter, and then you can cut that out precisely with an X-Acto knife once you remove it and that way you've created a gasket. So if you create it out of this, then you would bolt it on to your intake. Make sure you secure it again, bolt it on, don't just lay it over there. And then you can mark out what the difference is on there, either using a marker or a scriber or whatever works for you. Before I get started, let me show you the tool that I'll use the most for the porting. This is a Fordham SR series rotary tool. It's sort of like a Dremel that more people are used to, but it hangs, it's got this motor that you hang somewhere, and then it only uses a flex shaft. You don't actually attach any bits directly to this motor. You have to get a flex shaft, and then on the end of the flex shaft, it's got a whole lot of options for hand pieces. So this one I like because it's very thin, it's good for porting, because it fits in your hand nice, kind of like a pen or a pencil. There are some that are much larger if you prefer that. You can get them with different style of chucks. This is just a collet chuck where you have to tighten it down up here with a wrench. There are also types that you use basically like a drill chuck and you can tighten it down easily that way. So there's a whole lot of options there. You can plug the Fordham directly into an outlet and just let it run at full speed all the time. However, that's a pretty bad idea in my opinion because it's hard to switch on and off at the machine itself. It's better to have something closer to where you're working to switch it on and off. And also, you don't have very good control all the time at full speed. It's nice to be able to adjust the speed. So Fordham makes their own controllers. I actually had one for a while. Unfortunately, it broke. When it broke, I just stuck with this kind of generic router speed controller. These are pretty cheap, a lot cheaper than the Fordham controllers. Um, and they seem to work pretty well. And that allows you, if you switch it to variable, to change how fast the tool is spinning. And that gives you a whole lot more control than you have otherwise. Another important part of the process are the bits that you use. So you can see I've got a selection of single cut carbide burrs here. And most people tend to prefer something like a Christmas tree or a flame kind of shape similar to this. but you can see I've got a whole selection of shapes there to work with, whatever goes best for me. You can kind of choose maybe in a small tight spot you want to use a little ball there or for a certain shape. If you're doing something really flat you might be better off with a cylindrical. Just whatever works for you you can choose and these kits are pretty cheap so they're not cost prohibitive. Go ahead and pick up a whole kit and see what you like. You can get sets like this in single or double cut. So this is a single cut and this is a double cut. Not too hard to tell the difference between the two when you look at them. You can see that basically this is cutting two ways. It's got kind of a cross hatch look to it where this just has a single hatch going this way. So the double cut, like this one in the foreground right now, will remove material more quickly and this one removes material more slowly. Single cut is also good in my opinion for aluminum because it doesn't clog as easily. But I think especially for beginners you're better off to stick with a single cut because you really don't want that material disappearing any faster than it has to sometimes. Um, you can get yourself in trouble real quick. 
And trust me, you can remove material plenty fast enough on aluminum especially with a single cut burr. You may want something for a little finer finish in some areas, and in that case I usually pick up these little drum sander bits. Uh, they've got the very small ones and then the larger ones. Most of the time for these small ports, the tiniest of the two works the best because you really don't have a whole lot of room to get around in there. You may also want to keep some lights around so that you can shine those through the port and easily see what you're doing in there. These are just three lamps that somebody gave me for Christmas one year. Um, they're clip-ons and at first I thought I didn't know what I was going to do with these things but they turn out to be really handy for this stuff because you can find a spot for them easily. Um, and then if you go to Arbor Freight to buy tools they'll usually give you these things for free and they work quite well. You can put that for example up in your intake port and then that'll let you see through there. Last but not least is safety equipment. You definitely want to wear some safety glasses or safety goggles. It's a good idea to wear a mask or even a respirator when you're doing a lot of grinding if you're going to be putting dust into the air and you may want to protect your hands. That's up to you. Uh, some people like to wear gloves, some don't. I'm going to start with what should be the easiest task of the whole thing and just clean up the edge of this intake. So you can see I've got it set up in a vise, got my little light in there, and I'll just go around with my tool, carbide burr, and just knock that edge off so that I don't have that lip right at the end of the intake. As you saw, minimal effort there. You can run my finger all the way around and feel that there is no longer a lip there. I don't feel anything rough. It does feel a little sharp right on the corner, so I've just got a piece of 400 grit sandpaper, and I'm just gonna run around there real quick and take off any kind of razor sharp edge that I may have left. I'm not worried about really blending it. I just don't want it super sharp. There we go. One down, just gotta prop the other one up in the vise, do the same thing. Next I want to blend these sections of the intake ports into the rest of the port just to keep everything smoothed out. So you can see I've got my head propped up on a couple of pieces of 2x4 here. Makes it easy for me to access and I've got it positioned so that I can clearly see both of the spots that I'm going to work on. And propping it up also lets me slide my light under here so that I can look through either one of the ports. Sometimes before you start you may want to go ahead and put your burr in there make sure it fits the task. You can kind of go along the edge and see if it seems like it's going to do what you want. If not, switch out the burrs, give it another little test fit here, or test run, and then once you're satisfied with that, go ahead and start cutting. When I'm doing this, I am not putting a bunch of pressure in here. I'm just kind of letting the tool do its work. I'm putting it up against the surface, mild pressure, and I'm just trying to hold the tool steady and get it aimed and positioned where I need it to go to get the shape that I want. But I know you've heard it a million times, let the tool do the work for you. Don't force the tool. And whatever you do, if you start to chatter or you feel out of control, try turning the uh, speed down on your controller or see if another position or something can fix it because you don't want to do that. Also, avoid hitting the gasket ceiling area up here. You want to work right up to the edge in this case, but I don't want to get into the ceiling area. So you've got to control your tool. Sometimes it'll grab uh, on things in there 
and can kind of kick it out. So you want to be really careful of that. I like to get in there and use my finger and you can still feel if there's any kind of hump or ridge there and just make sure everything is blended in. You're probably going to want to clear out dust and debris at some point while you work. So what I do is just use this air gun attached to my compressor and I regulate my compressor way down to about 30 PSI because I don't want to blast this stuff all over the place. I just want to make sure I can get it to move and make sure you wear your safety glasses while you do this. That's blended in basically the way I want it. I may go in there with a sanding drum just to finish it off a little bit, but before I do that, it saves a little time if you've got multiple things to do with the same bit. I'm going to go ahead and use this on the other port that needs the same work, and then when I'm done with that, I can switch over to the sanding drum rather than switching back and forth more times than I need to. Obviously, you can do it whatever way you're comfortable with, but that'll save you a little bit of time. Now these are both blended how I want them. I can go through there with my finger or thumb and feel that it's a smooth transition all the way up to the edge. And the port is going to taper down to be smaller in most cases as it goes inward toward the valves, but you just don't want to feel like a hump up here. Sometimes you can really feel a hump there. You want it to feel like just a smooth transition in. And I've got that on both. I also took out a little bit of casting flaw that you could see down this edge and now I'm ready to switch over to a sanding drum and just finish that off. Now I've got this flipped around to show you this casting flaw that's running down the side of the port. And it's this way on both sides of each port. This is the worst of them. I've already smoothed it out over here with my sanding drum. And I'm going to go ahead and smooth it out here. Now that goes pretty much all the way down to the valve seat and there's no way I'm going to reach there from here. But I'll get out what I can. Not a big deal. Again, I'm not trying to remove a bunch of material. All I want to do is smooth out that flaw. And with this thing it's not too bad. It's got a nice shield on here using this handpiece. Some grinder setups are going to be dangerous. You could really get into something you could with this one too example if this was spinning and you catch that edge so you got to be really conscious of that if you're getting into the ports and that's not perfect but it's better than it was and i really didn't take much material out of there at all while you're up here looking at these ports, I would suggest just go around with your finger, thumb, whatever, and just make sure you don't feel anything really sharp that you can reach while you're right here. If you're working on heads like mine that are split port, so you've got one port that goes into two valves, then you're going to have ridges in there where the ports split off. So this one port splits into two ports. And you can see that running down the center there. That's on the top, the roof, and the floor of the port. Now in that case, I'm not going to mess with it. Some people smooth those out, some people like to leave them sharp. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know 100% off the top of my head which is the best way to go, and I really don't want to get that far into the porting. I'm not trying to do anything risky like I said before, so I'm going to leave that alone. But if you feel those, make sure you take a look at them. You may not be feeling a casting flaw, you may be feeling the port dividers there. I bolted up one of the intakes to the head so we can take a look down inside of there and see the match. So this is unusual. Again, this is a very straight inlet with a lot of setups. There's a lot more of a curve and you can't really do this. But I can actually see down in there and even get my fingers down in there to feel it. And what I can tell is there is a slight mismatch. However, there's probably always going to be unless you modify the bolts. You use a special bolt that takes up all the slack or you put dowels in there or something along those lines. To positively locate this every time you put it on but the mismatch is how I'd like it it's the intake being just slightly smaller in a spot or two than the port in the head 
So if the port and the head were smaller, air would come in there and hit a wall. That's really bad. I would rather have it expand a little bit than to run into a wall. So that's pretty much how I would like it. I hadn't really planned to do anything to the exhaust side, but it's got some pretty obvious casting flaws in both of the ports. So I'll just go ahead and sand those out real quick. Now I'm getting ready to start the hard part. And the reason that this is way more difficult than the other part is, is well, first off, you're working in smaller areas. This is not as large of an opening, so that makes everything a little tougher. But the main thing is your valve seats are very critical. You do not want to scratch those, nick those, anything. You've got to be very, very careful around your valve seats. Now, in this case, the valve seat or the valve seat insert goes all the way from this line that you can see down here all the way up and it's this whole fitting that's pressed into the head. Down here we're not really worried about too much this straight section. What we are worried about is up here where you can see the angles where the valve actually seats against that seat because if you don't have a good surface there if it's not a true surface if it's got nicks, cuts, scratches, etc the valve cannot seal there You'll get a leak and you'll have big trouble. So you got to be really careful not to scratch and scuff those up. There are multiple schools of thought here. A couple of the most popular are some people just say I can be careful and I'll go ahead and get in there and just watch my angles and make sure that I never hit that part up there with my grinder. That can be kind of tough because you get one little slip if it grabs something and pulls away. Next thing you know you get into a valve seat and you've ruined that seat or maybe even ruined the head depending on the exact application. Uh, this is not something that most of us are going to do at home where you just get a valve seat out of there and push it right, press it right back in and you're good to go. It's more likely a machine shop kind of operation especially with some small heads you may end up that it's cheaper to replace the whole head. I actually did this with a uh, 49cc years ago. I got the whole port job done and right at the end I nicked the valve seat and it was just enough it didn't seal. I tried it anyway and ended up shooting flames out of the exhaust and burn a hole in the valve. So got to be really, really careful. So anyway, not a good idea, especially if you're new to this, just to assume that you'll be fine. But that's what a lot of people will do. I may even try that myself. We'll see because I do have a lot of room here. Some valve seats, you really don't have much room. They're not this deep or thick here. So it's basically just the seating area, the ceiling area, and then a very small lip there. And those are really, really tough. This one's a little easier to work with because you've got some room. If you've got very thin valve seats so you don't have all that extra area there, maybe even if yours are this way but you just want to push the porting a little further, then what most people will do is mark this area of the seat, all the top area, use dicum or layout fluid, whatever you want to call it, or I just use a Sharpie. And I'm going to go ahead and show you this process in case it's of use to you. So again, a Sharpie will work, assuming your Sharpie does work. There we go. So a Sharpie will work. You just want to mark all the way around there. And you don't have to get deep into there. By the time you hit the spot where the angle changes and it goes straight in, that's far enough. Now you need to make sure that the valve guide inside the head there is very, very clean on the inside bore. So if you've been porting like I have a little bit, then you're going to want to clean everything out very thoroughly. Some parts cleaner, run some water through there, compressed air, whatever you need to do to make sure that is very, very clean. You're also going to need the valve that goes into that cylinder and it needs to be very clean as well. The first thing I'll do is take my little squirt bottle. I've got motor oil, the same stuff that I use in my engine. And I'm going to go ahead and squirt that into the valve guide. 
Next, you're gonna need some valve lapping or valve grinding compound. And there are multiple brands and grits of this stuff. It really doesn't matter for this process because we're not gonna do a full lapping job here. I just wanna to try to make some marks. I'll take a little bit of that and put it on the back of the valve, roughly in the seating area. I'm not too worried about getting a lot of it on here, just for this. Now I'll put some of that oil on the valve stem. Just rub that around, make sure you're not getting any of the valve grinding compound up here. You don't want that grit inside of your valve guides. Then I can just drop this valve down through that guide till it seats. Now you'll need to rotate this valve around somehow just to spin it right on its seat. And you could do it by hand. Most people are going to use one of these valve lapping suction cup setups here. You can get them from pretty much any parts store. I'll try to put a link in the description too. Um, and you'll just stick that to the face of the valve and then you can spin it around by hand. Some people like to flip the head around and get a drill in there and grab onto the other end of the valve. Usually put some masking tape on it to protect the valve stem and spin it that way. But I generally use these and you may want to, we'll say lubricate this, moisten this up. Usually most people just put a little spit on there or a little moisture and Stick that to the valve. And then once it's stuck, you just basically spin it between your hands. Light pressure, not very much. You're pretty much just letting it sit there. Okay, now I can pull that valve out this way. Now I've got a damp paper towel or rag. I'm just gonna go around and try to get that valve lapping compound out of there real quick. You don't want to use a chemical like brake parts cleaner because you're going to remove whatever you just marked on there with. So again, just a little bit of moisture on a rag should do it. And now you can clearly see where your actual valve seating surface is. So anywhere that you have removed that marker or whatever you use to mark it is where the valve is seating. So I can look all the way around. It goes basically right up to that edge there. So now I would know that whatever I do, I have to stay away from anywhere that I remove that marking. And really, you probably want to leave at least an eighth of an inch, I would think, for most people, because you don't want to push it, get too close. Um, there's all sorts of things with thermal properties, the thickness of these and whatnot, but mostly just so you don't nick it, you'll want to leave a little bit of room and don't grind everything away. For me, I'm really not planning on getting that close to anything. I don't think I need to. But that's how you do it if you want to really go to extremes and try to push as far as you can. You would have to know where that seating area is. When you're all done and you want to clean this up, usually the best thing for me is just a little bit of carb cleaner on a rag. And then you can wipe over that and that'll get rid of the marking. It's really not going to hurt anything if you did leave that marking in there anyway. But you know, you want to finish up a nice clean job there. And also before you wrap that up, anytime you use valve lapping compound, I would suggest cleaning the entire area out again, especially making sure you don't have any of that down inside of your valve guide. Again, I have no reason or no desire to push all the way up to that edge in any spot. So I'm going to take a more cautious approach and try to protect this area while I pour it. That's kind of tricky because you can't really put too much in here or it's going to get in the way of your tool and you're not going to be able to get into the port. But I've got some Gorilla Tape here. Some people use duct tape, racers tape, whatever they call it. And I'm going to try to wrap that around so that it protects the area that I can see is the actual seat area. I'm just going to try to stick that right over the seat area. And luckily for me, these seats, again, are pretty deep. So I don't have to be super precise with this. As long as I can get it in there, make sure I cover that and don't cover so far down that I'm getting into the tape when I'm working on it. Now I'm just going ahead and adding a second layer of protection there. Which also is a little wider. It should help to hold that stuff into the head, I hope. 
This is definitely not a perfect job. I'm sure you could do much better if you'd like, but the seat area is protected. I mean, you can imagine how much protection two layers of this is versus nothing as you see over here. Even if something like the shaft from this got into the side a little bit, that should protect it. Now don't think that you are totally protected here because if the actual carbide cutter gets into that duct tape or Gorilla Tape, whatever, it's gonna rip it off of there in very short order. But at least you have a little bit of protection there just in case. Unfortunately, these are not gigantic ports like a big block V8, so it's hard enough for me to be able to see what I'm doing as well as get in there. I don't know how well I'll be able to cover this with camera shots, so I will just remind you again before I do anything. I will try to take off a little bit of the casting flashback here if I can, but primarily I'm in here just trying to work on the transition between that valve seat, the bottom of that valve seat, where it goes into the head and make sure I don't have any ledges in there. That is the main thing that I'm after. And the other really important thing again is do not nick, scratch, touch the valve seat. And here it is even more important to do a little bit of a test run first. Take your bit and figure out where you're gonna go with it. Plan your actions out. You don't wanna get part way in there. Realize that doesn't work when you hit something and knock it into the valve seat. So. Try to plan out your actions a little bit before you begin. Anytime I'm not sure exactly what I'm seeing or doing in there, then I just stop and I'll go over it with my finger or the scriber here just to make sure I'm 100% certain what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing, and that I'm headed in the right direction. I do have one area right in here that's very close but I can't quite get it smoothed out all the way using this tool it's just a little too large for that area so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the ball shaped tool and I think I should be able to get in there and smooth that out the rest of the way I'm not totally done with this port but I'm done as much as I can do right now because I thought I had more quarter inch sandpaper rolls around and I don't so can't get them right at this moment so I'm gonna go ahead and peel this tape off so I can get a good look at the area and you can see with this Gorilla Tape where it hasn't been on there for too long it's not real hard to pull off I do have some debris there mostly where the uh, the residue from the tape has got aluminum stuck to it but I'll just use some parts cleaner in there that should clean that out real quick This gives me another good opportunity to show you a worked over port versus an unworked port. And again, I can put my finger in there. I wish you could feel this for yourself, but you don't feel a bunch of ridges. Everything feels pretty smooth, transitioning all the way through where the seat matches up to the head and through the rest of the port where I could reach. And honestly, this is a pretty good setup, so there wasn't a whole lot to work. Then in here, all kinds of lumps and bumps and ridges and things that disrupt airflow. Again, you can take a scriber or something sharp, just don't mess up your seats, go through there and nothing catches. All the way around, nothing catches. On this side, it runs into a ridge here, it runs into a ridge where the seat meets up, and it's got that kind of stuff all the way around the entire port. There's not a whole lot of material removed. This isn't much bigger than it started out, but it's just much more smooth all the way through the port. I flipped the head around to give you a different view. The first time around, we were looking at the port roof where it meets up, which is up here now. This time around, we're looking where the port floor or the short turn radius meets up into the valve area. So again, this is the one that I've worked over. This is the one that I haven't touched. And just with a light passing through there and what lights in the room, you can actually see some of these sharp edges without even having to look closely. So you can see that this edge here is catching light 
You can see the difference in the shadows on both of those. There are shadows on either one, obviously, because of the angle of the light down in there, but clearly a lot more shadowing in here because of all of the edges and the roughness in there. Again, I wish you could feel this for yourself, but the short turn radius here feels so much nicer. It's very smooth, and this one, there's all kinds of stuff to catch you up. Same deal with a scribe, all sorts of places that you can catch that scribe on either side of this little area here. Whereas on this side, it all goes through nice and smooth. So once again, same deal over here. Didn't remove a lot of material, just everything is smoothed out. Now I just need to do the same thing seven more times. These times I'm not going to bother with lapping the valve in any because again, I'm really not trying to get all that close to it and I know it's right on that edge. I just finished the last of the intake ports, at least with the carbide burrs. So I'm getting ready to move on to the exhaust ports, which are going to be even more fun because it's a smaller port than the intake port. So it's just harder to get in there and to see in there. Before I do, I'll show you something that I have figured out, at least for me, along the way. First, when I finish up, I do take the tape off that protects the seat. And that makes it a lot easier to get in there and make sure everything is smooth. You can get a better angle on it, you just have to be really careful not to nick the seat or come into contact with it. Second, I'm basically just using two different burrs. So I've got this flame shaped cutter or tree shaped cutter, and then I've got the ball shaped cutter. And what I've found for me is that when you get into areas like this where you're going to have to blend the steel seat into the aluminum, sometimes you've got where the aluminum just comes up above the steel, most times it's pretty easy just to use this tree shaped cutter, flame shaped cutter, whatever, and do it that way. But if you've got to remove the steel, if I use a long cutter like this, it comes into contact with the aluminum sometimes and it'll take the aluminum out when I'm trying to take the steel out. But if I use something short like this ball cutter, I can get that edge of the steel a lot easier without taking out the aluminum below it. So at least for me, that's pretty helpful. At this point, I've got all eight of the ports almost finished just using these two different carbide burrs in my rotary tool. But my sanding drum showed up today, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue and see if I can get these smoothed out anymore. If not, it's no big deal because these actually leave a pretty good finish, um, especially for the intake side. You really don't want it super smooth, but these are 60 grit. I went with Dremel. I did not buy the cheap generic stuff. Um, I've used them many times. However, sometimes the generic drums here, they will fly apart really quickly. And in this case, the difference of a few bucks is not worth having these fly apart and something comes out and nicks a seat. So I went ahead and bought the actual Dremel attachments in this case. This is the one that was done with the sanding drums. This was done with burrs. And I don't think I'm making a whole lot of difference in the port by going over it with the sanding drums. I'm taking more risk. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and go over these again, just make sure there are no large glaring imperfections that I haven't cleaned up. 
And once that's finished, I'm just going to call that done. I barely touched the valve end of these ports with that sander. And if I had it to do all over again, I probably would have never touched them with that sander because I think I can do just as well with the carbide burrs on this side. And why take the extra risk of getting something else in there again to accomplish almost nothing when you may nick a valve seat. So yeah, again, I would just take a little few more extra minutes with the burrs and I think you can get a pretty decent finish. Obviously, it's going to depend on the exact burrs that you're using, the speed that you run out, uh, the motion of the ocean, you know, all that kind of crap. But where the sanding drums did come in handy quite a bit was the larger sections like the outlets of the exhaust ports. I could smooth those out a little bit better and especially the intake ports where I was trying to blend that in earlier. Um, being such a large area and using small burrs doesn't work great to get a uniform finish. So the half inch sanding drum did do a pretty good job in there. I took the head and thoroughly washed it with water. I went through every nook and cranny, every passageway. I sprayed through the valve guides, sprayed into the water jackets, everywhere in here. I tried to hit with water and then I thoroughly dried it off with an air gun. Again, going through every single passage because I want to get every bit of aluminum out of there that I possibly can for the next step. And the next step is going to be lapping the valves. So I talked about that a little bit earlier when I showed you marking one of the valve seats and trying to see where the contact area was but same basic process i've got all of my valves lined up back here everything is bagged and labeled if you've watched the other videos i've already made it clear that when you uh, remove you disassemble a head and then reassemble a head that you need to label everything exactly where it goes because you don't want to mix and match everything should be wearing together and you want to keep it together. So I've got all that stuff laid out and everything is labeled. I also have a brand new intake and brand new exhaust valve because I had one badly bent valve and one that was kind of minor out of spec and I just decided to replace it while I was at it. They took a couple months to get here from Yamaha but I've got them now. I've got valve grinding or lapping compound. This is the Permatex brand which is a little bit different than what you'll find with some of the other types of valve grinding or lapping compounds because they don't tell you a grit, fine, coarse, whatever, where a lot of them do. What Permatex says is that multiple grits are incorporated into this, and as you lap the valves, it will go from coarse to fine on its own as it sort of processes when you're doing the work. You'll need something to rotate the valves. I've showed you this earlier. The suction cup deal, and you'll spin the valves that way. I've got motor oil. That's going to be to lubricate the guides as well as the valve stems and then of course you'll want some safety equipment I'm just gonna wear some latex gloves and safety glasses essentially what I'm after with valve lapping is just to clean up the seat area of the valve seat itself and to clean up the seating area on the back of the valve head and that can remove pitting and uh, carbon deposits and things like that if you can't get them out of there otherwise but it also helps them fit together better and seal better. Anytime I'm going this far and porting ahead, then I go ahead and lap the valves before I put it back together. So I'm going to start here. This is labeled intake 1A. So I'm going to go ahead and take my little squirter and put some oil down into the guide. I'm going to take some of my valve grinding compound and apply that to the back of the valve in the seating area and try to get it all the way around. Then I will coat the valve stem with some oil. And go ahead and put that valve down in there, put the stem through the guide. Just crushed my flashlight. Push that down. Now I'll go ahead and stick my suction cup onto basically the center of the valve. You'll probably have to put a little moisture on there to get it to stick. And just push down. There you go. Now lapping the valve is very simple. Just going to take both palms and spin this between my palms and you should hear if you listen closely you'll hear that the noise changes as I go it starts off 
you can hear that it's really rough and then you'll hear that it's smoothing out. A lot of people like to pick up, put down a little bit. Yeah, you can hear it's not really making much noise at all now. So I'll go ahead and pull that out of there. And I'll go ahead and clean off the valve itself. Whatever you do, you want to make sure you don't cross contaminate. You don't want to get that valve grinding compound onto the stem or into the guide. And then I can also wipe off the seat area. I'll start by checking the seat in the head and you can see a band around there where the valve has lapped against it and that band is very clean very smooth I don't see any pitting it looks good to me then I'll give the valve the same inspection very obvious on the valve this clean shiny section all the way around there spin that around take a good look same deal looks nice and smooth I don't see pitting it doesn't look porous I don't see debris on there so I'm going to call this one done. Before the valve gets put away, I'm going to clean it very thoroughly with some brake parts cleaner to make sure there is no debris left on there from the valve grinding compound. And then I'll store it in my label bags again until I'm ready to do the cylinder head assembly. If you're not satisfied with the results, then go ahead and repeat that process on the same valve. For me, I'm happy with the way it turned out, so I'm going to move on and I've just got to do all the other seven valves on the cylinder head. I'm not going to show you that in any great detail because it's the exact same process on every single one. The main thing you got to keep track of, obviously, is don't get grit into the guides or anywhere it's not supposed to be. And make sure you know exactly what valve you're working with. Again, you should have them labeled and separated somehow. And always lap the proper valve with the proper port. After all of the valves were lapped, I cleaned the head very thoroughly. I started off with water, then moved to brake parts cleaner, and then an air gun. And with each step, I went through every single bolt hole, the uh, valve guide, spark plug threads, ports, every part of the head. Just to be sure I could get all of the lapping compound, any materials left over, anything gritty, so it won't affect the head later and won't cause any damage. Now I want to try to put the head back together, reinstall all of the valves. The first thing that I'm going to do is install all new valve stem seals. So when you look into each one of these passages here, you'll see the top of the valve guide. And on top of that valve guide should set a valve stem seal. When you do this kind of work, you want to replace those. So I've got eight brand new seals here from Yamaha. And I'll just install all eight of them before I do any of the other valve stuff. I'm going to take a drop of motor oil and put that onto my fingertip while wearing a glove and dab that over the top of the end of that valve guide. Then I'm going to take one of my new seals and put a couple of drops of oil into it. If you hold it upside down, you'll get some on your finger and then you can rub it on the other end of there as well. I'll hold the valve stem seal gently with a pair of needle nose pliers. I'm not putting any more pressure than I have to on there just to hold it. And then I'm going to try to put that into place over top of that valve guide. I'm not trying to seat it all the way yet. I just want to get it roughly into place. I'm going to move it around, not using a whole lot of pressure. There's a bit of a lip on there, so I'm going to hold my pliers open a little and try to push just on the metal portion of that valve seal. And try to get that pushed straight down onto the guide. Push right down there. There we go. I felt a little pop. I push with my thumb. Make sure it seems to be in place.
Now I'm going to get ready to install my valves one by one. So first off, I've said it a bunch of time in these videos, but I'll say it one more time to be sure. Make sure everything is organized and everything is grouped together. So I labeled these 1A, 1B, 2A, and 2B for the intake valves. I know this is all stuff from 1B and I know that the spot on my head is 1B, so it's all going in the right spot exactly where it came from. Then get everything out and clean it. All of this stuff has been cleaned with brake parts cleaner and then wiped off. So you don't want to install dirty parts after going through all this work. I'm going to start with what for me is labeled intake 1B. That's this spot right here. So first I've got my valve for that and I'm just going to put a drop of oil on here on the stem and rub that in. I do not want an excessive amount of oil. I just want a little bit of lubrication on there. Then I'll flip the head over and I can slide the valve in down through the valve guide. Clean this off real quick. Now that'll probably stay, but make sure you keep a finger or something on that to hold it in place. And then I'm going to flip the head back over. Next, I've got this base here and it will be installed with this section facing upward or the flat section facing down. Just drop that on over there and you should see it sits right around the valve guide. Then the valve spring needs to go on. Now you have to pay attention here because these springs do need to be installed a certain way. If you look closely, look at the bottom and look at the top and look at the spacing between the coils. Hopefully you can tell that the spacing here is more narrow, the spacing up here is wider. This is the top, this is the bottom. So narrow spacing toward the bottom, wide spacing toward the top. So I'm going to drop that down with a narrow spacing facing down. Now my valve spring retainer can sit on top of that. You should see it's kind of centered over top of the valve stem. Next I need to set up my valve spring compressor. If you watch me take this head apart and remove the valves, this is the exact same tool that I used for that. I'm going to use one finger and just sort of hold this retainer and the valve spring in place so it doesn't fall out while I flip the head up and try to position this over top of both sides of the valve. I'm going to start really trying to align the top, put a little pressure on here, not much, just screw it in a little bit to help it hold. Try to align the bottom adapter here with the valve so that it's just on the valve face and not on the head. I'm going to screw that down a little bit, a little more pressure. At the same time, I have to make sure the top adapter is centered over top of the retainer. And once both of those are aligned properly, I can go ahead and screw this down to compress the spring. Now you can see I've got the spring compressed far enough that you can clearly see the groove at the top of the valve stem. Now the valve cotters or keepers need to go in. So when you look at those, you'll see a groove toward one edge. That is the top edge. You'll also notice that they're tapered. So the wider edge is the top and the narrow edge is the bottom, faces down. What I want to try to do is drop them in so that they fit sort of around the valve. When they're both in there, it'll form kind of a half circle. And they can be kind of tricky, especially when you're trying to keep your fingers out of the camera shot. But there's basically where one should go. You can see it sat down in there. And then the other one is going to need to go over on the other side. And I'm trying to get that in there without being totally in your way, but it may not be working. All right, now we're getting there. Okay. When you look in there, you can see that they're trying to form a half circle. They're not in place yet, so they won't really form it the way they should. But one is covering this side, the other is covering this side, and that's basically how I want them. Now I'm going to unscrew this. As I watch those, they should kind of fall right into place. Yep. Go ahead and totally unscrew this. 
remove this from the head. And if everything went well, you should see that they are down there. They are aligning with that groove in the valve stem and they are forming a circle. Obviously, they're not large enough to form a complete circle. You're going to have a gap somewhere, but basically they form a circle around there. Just like most of the things I've shown you, from here on, it's the same process for the remaining seven valves, one at a time, and again, keep everything organized, put everything in the same spot that it came out of. All of the valves are back in, so the head's pretty much ready to go back on the engine. But I picked up new exhaust studs while I was doing this because the old ones were so rusty. So I'm going to go ahead and install them in there while it's easier right now on the bench. That about wraps it up for this video. As always, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, if you found it helpful or you've learned something, please be sure to give it a like, share it with anyone you know that it may also help, and don't forget to subscribe for more so you don't miss the rest of the T-Max 500 service series and my other scooter videos. Thanks again.